It goes without saying that one of the most tragic moments in the history of children's movies comes from the scene involving the swamps of sadness in the never-ending story. Little Atreyu not only has the weight of saving the world of Fantasia on his shoulders, as he must save it from the destructive force known as the Nothing, but he and his horse Artax must try to make it through these sad swamps. The Swamps of Sadness have foreboding powers. If the sadness overwhelms you, you will sink into the swamps forever. Although Atreyu seems fine, something still isn't right. It's Artax. Artax is being consumed by the swamp. Atreyu tries with all his might and will to save his best friend, but the sadness of the swamp is too overpowering, and just like that, Artax sinks and is no more. And a generation of children were left traumatized and needing therapy. And it's all because of this guy, a character called Parmenta, who is described as being a giant, but one who is increasingly shrinking due to the nothing. But I know what you're all thinking. Parmenta? Uh, who the heck is that? I don't remember him from the never-ending story. Well, he was part of a deleted scene where he bumped into Atreyu by a lake and informed him to visit Morla, the Ancient One. And so this leads to Atreyu and Artax to travel through the swamps. And thus, Artax sinking. So it's all this guy's fault that our childhoods had to go through such an emotional roller coaster. Yeah, thanks a lot, guy. <laughs> So today we are going to explore the lost version of the never-ending story. Okay, not so much a lost version, but more of an alternative one. An original German cut. One of which that has definitely been overshadowed by the more well-known mainstream international cut. So, let's check it out. So in order to start this journey, we have to travel back to 1979 to German writer Michael Ender. Although considered a children's writer, Ender felt that his stories deal with fantasy and escapism, of which is for everyone, from ages 8 to 80, where he says, quote, It is for this child in me, and in all of us, that I tell my stories. In his earlier career, he was best known for writing books based on a fictional character called Jim Button. But in 1979, his golden opus, The Neverending Story, was published and was hugely successful in his homeland of Germany as well as Japan. Now, alternative movie versions of The Neverending Story aside, the original book is also its own version, as there are several striking differences. Now, just some of these include Fantasia, originally being called Fantastica, Atreyu being described as having green skin and blue hair, and Bastion, the earthbound child reading the never-ending story, is described as being overweight and with glasses. Interestingly enough, the book wouldn't get an English translation till 1983, one year before the movie's release. It's here we cut to German producer, Bernd Eichinger. His children loved the never-ending story book and pleaded with him to make a movie out of it. So the production started with him as producer. At first, author Michael Ender was really happy for his book to be adapted into a movie. German director Wolfgang Peterson was hired to direct the never-ending story movie, as he had previously directed the war movie, Das Boot. At first, Peterson and Ender worked closely together on the script, and all seemed to be well. However, the collaborative honeymoon period was over, as according to Ender, Peterson then basically rewrote the script without Ender's input, or even his knowledge for that matter, and that Ender felt that the story had now greatly strayed away from his original vision. To him, it no longer reflected his book. So he requested to have the production come to a halt, presumably to give him time to try and shift things back more to his original story, or to just change the movie's title entirely. You know, cut all ties from the original never-ending story book. But the movie's production were like, nah, we're all good, thanks. So the production carried on business as usual. So Ender was probably really annoyed at this stage and took the production to court over the matter. 
but he ultimately lost the case. Probably because at that stage, the book's rights were bought and paid for, signed, sealed, and delivered. Sadly though, because of the behind the scenes conflict, Ender doesn't seem to have much love for the never ending story movie, calling it, quote, a gigantic melodrama of kish, commerce, plush, and plastic. Regardless, the show must go on, with the never-ending story's budget estimated to be between 25 to 27 million dollars, with the never-ending story being the most expensive movie at that time that wasn't made by the US or the USSR. And it was filmed on a soundstage in Munich, with the scenes on Earth being filmed at Vancouver, Canada. And so the shoot carried on, with sets creating strange fictional worlds, as well as fantastical creatures far beyond the bounds of imagination, all being created and brought to life on the big screen. Now, The Never Ending Story was originally released in West Germany in April 1984, and this first release was in fact a different cut of the movie, a German cut, with several striking changes from the cut that we all now know, and in many cases grew up with. So what happened? Well, three words. Steven frickin' Spielberg. Okay, so here's what happened. According to Collider.com, Spielberg and Wolfgang Peterson were friends and would often ask each other for advice. Spielberg at that time was in the early development stages of Schindler's List, which actually wouldn't go into full production till many years later. And he would ask Peterson where he thought the best European locations would be to film that movie. And Peterson asked Spielberg how he could make changes to the never-ending story in order to appeal to an English-speaking audience. In other words, a more Hollywoodized version of the movie. And look, it makes sense to ask Spielberg for help when it comes to family fantasy movies, as during the 80s, he was a money-making machine when it came to making successful movies of that genre, having directed E.T. the Extraterrestrial, which was the biggest movie of that time, as well as producing other fantastical crowd-pleasers, like Gremlins, The Goonies, and Back to the Future, to name but just a few. So Spielberg helped with a re-edit of the never-ending story by making minor tweaks and trims in order to give the movie a snappier flow so the movie can get from one scene to another at a quicker pace with about seven minutes worth of footage being removed for this new international cut as well as certain changes to music cues and redubs with this now Spielbergized version of the never-ending story being released on July the 20th 1984 of which the never-ending story all up would make 100 million dollars in the box office it's actually amazing that Spielberg found the time to create this new edit of the never-ending story as also that year he directed Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom as well as produced the as mentioned Gremlins. And it seems that Peterson was also really happy with this new cut. As a way of saying thank you to Spielberg, he gifted him with the Orin prop that was used in the movie. Wow, that's one heck of a gift. So it's here that we'll explore some of the changes between the two cuts. At first glance, they may seem like minor insignificant changes, but they actually do impact the experience of the never-ending story, as well as slightly alter its narrative. Firstly, there's the movie's intro. In the international cut, the movie starts off with some amazing visuals of the surreal skies of Fantasia, letting the viewer know right away you're stepping into a strange, brand new and slightly spooky world. All while the cool and memorable never-ending story pop song is played. The song was performed by British pop singer La Mole and American singer Beth Anderson. However, in the original cut, there was no La Mole. Nope, that memorable song was nowhere in sight, or rather sound. And the movie starts with a simple black screen, with an intro theme which sounds more foreboding and definitely has a darker mood. In fact, the original soundtrack was composed by German musician Klaus Doldinger. However, for the international cut, a lot of the music would be reworked with a more up-to-date synthesized sound by Italian composer Giorgio Moroder. That's why in the international cut, the scenes at the Ivory Tower sounds like this. But in the original German cut, it uses a slower orchestral version of the Bastion's flight theme. I think both musical cues are good, but in my opinion, Giorgio Ramoda's theme does sound more surreal and like you're entering a strange and powerful domain. 
In the traumatic scene where Artax dies, in the international cut, the scene is accompanied by some really sad music, which appropriately goes with the scene. Come on! However, in the original cut, there wasn't any musical score at all. All we hear are the desperate screams of Atreyu frantically trying to save his horse, as well as distressing sounds coming from Artax, which actually get drowned out by the score in the international cut. Come on! Not having any music to push for an emotional response from the audience does make this scene feel less sad, but instead it actually makes the scene oddly more urgent and intense. The sad music in the international cut kind of sets it up right away that Artax is a goner, in order to prepare the audience that this is the end of that horse, so you know what's going to happen as soon as those musical cues start. But without the music, it's more of a frantic struggle for Atreyu to save Artax, and just goes to show how much music can change a scene, and create different emotional responses. There are longer scenes at the Bucks household, like Bastion slowly getting out of bed and looking sullen at the breakfast table. Now obviously these cuts were made to move the story forward faster. But, as others have pointed out, these shots are important, as they are a reflection on Bastion's current state. He's unmotivated, uninspired, and has difficulties functioning due to the grieving process over the loss of his mother. In other words, Bastion is lost and unhappy with his surroundings, as well as his father's failure to acknowledge his pain and hardship. Henceforth, because of these scenes, we know that it would be easy for Bastion, such a lost kid, to find comfort and escape in the exciting world of Fantasia. There is a scene in the original cut where while reading the never-ending story in the school attic, Bastion has to hide as the school's caretaker enters the attic in order to dump a few odds and ends there, where he trips over the mat that Bastion had placed on the floor. And I can see why the scene was cut. It doesn't really need to be there, and I think that it also breaks the illusion that while Bastion is in the attic reading the book, he's in his own little world, narratively speaking, with the outside world being cut off. I don't think this illusion should be broken by outsiders wandering into this space. That, and if you listen carefully to the caretaker, he actually swears. Oh, shit. Yeah, the never-ending story could have featured the word shit. Just take a moment to let that sink in. Also, some of the creature effects were removed from the international cut. For example, as Gamork is about to attack Atreyu in the swamp, only for Atreyu to be saved by Falcor, we actually get a face reveal of Gamork. This was to be the first time that we see the character, but that reveal was saved till nearly the movie's climax. Although this shot is impressive, I do think it's scarier knowing that there is a monster hunting Atreyu without us, the audience, knowing exactly what the monster looks like, you know, the first time we watch the movie. And sometimes leaving things to the viewer's imagination can be scarier. And it makes sense that Spielberg would make this cut, as it's similar to how he shot Jaws. Throughout that movie, we barely see the shark, but we know it's there, which many agree is scarier than actually showing the monster. So Spielberg may have actually applied that logic to Gamork. The international cut also removed this shot of Falcor being blown away into the void. It's been theorized that this is probably due to the fact that the effect looked, well, crap. When we finally do see Gamork, in the original cut, he has a different voice. As you can see, in the international version, he sounded like this. If you come any closer, I will rip you to shreds. But in the original German cut, he sounded like this. If you come any closer, I will rip you to shreds. In all honesty, the two voices sound quite similar, so it baffles the mind as to why the change was even made. You can mainly hear the difference the way the character says shreds. 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 As in the international cut, he sort of sounds like Sean Connery when he says it. Shreds. Speaking of voice changes, we then get to the character Teeny Weeny, as in that little guy with the snail. And wow, talk about a contrast of different voices. As any never-ending story fan knows, in the international cut, he sounded like this. Poor baby. 
I think I know what it was. Tell us more. But in the original cut, they gave him a voice where he sounded like Joe Exotic, the Tiger King on Helium. Rockbiter, what you have told us is also happening where I live in the West. We're on the same mission. After all, if the Empress can't save us, who could? Ugh, well I'll be goddamned. And just quickly, going back to Gamork for a second here, there's some dialogue in the Gerben cut that wasn't in the international cut where he speaks about becoming weak. I am almost too weak to kill you, but I will find the strength. So does this suggest that the nothing is also affecting Gamork and, like everything else in Fantasia, is killing him? Despite him working for the nothing? So, as he says, he can control mankind because they've lost their hopes and dreams. Well, how can he do that if, like everything else in Fantasia, the nothing has destroyed him? Isn't that interesting? It's almost like the nothing itself is tricking and manipulating Gamork to do its bidding, where in fact he is just another one of its victims. Then there's the destruction of Fantasia itself. In the international cut, we're led to believe that once Fantasia is gone, all there is, is a black void. However, there is a deleted scene where we see the childlike Empress sitting within the ruins of Fantasia, where it looks like a red, fiery void, with Fantasia's destruction looking like, well, hell while the Empress looks sad and defeated. Yeah, once again, this is more disturbing than what we see in the international cut. The scene follows with Bastion coming face to face with the Empress, where he tells her, You are so beautiful. Which is a line not used in the final film. Look, and when talking about the international cut, I know I'm making it all sound deleted scene this and deleted scene that, as if Spielberg and Peterson just hacked up the movie with their chainsaws, but that's not entirely the case, as the international cut did have some scenes specifically filmed exclusively for that cut, of which weren't in the original, including a close-up of some of the inhabitants of Fantasia at the Ivory Tower. And the people with the two faces, man, what was with that? They freaked me out. Seriously, when I was a kid, they scared the Saturday morning Coco Pops out of me. And of course, a shot of the Auron reflecting out of the water, causing Falcor to dive in and retrieve it. Unlike the original version where he just dives in seemingly for no rhyme or reason. So it's here we get to the never-ending story's most notorious deleted scene. One that wasn't featured in any version of the movie. A scene where while Atreyu and Artex are relaxing at a lake, a sad lonely man approaches them called Parmenta. He explains that he is a giant from a species of giants, but he is the last of his kind, as all the other giants have been wiped out by the nothing, and that he is more and more increasingly shrinking. Hence the fact that he's no longer a giant, and that he feels weak. Very similar to the cut dialogue that Gamork would go on to say to Atreyu. Parmenta asks Atreyu if he has any shoes that he can give him. Atreyu does not. Atreyu approaches the shrinking giant, offering to help him, but Parmenter doesn't want Atreyu to get too close, as he has been infected by the nothing, almost making it sound like a contagious disease, which is an interesting idea and one that's not really explored in the final movie itself. And is it just me, or does Parmenter kind of look like Gandalf from Lord of the Rings? Parmenter tells Atreyu to seek help to stop the nothing from Morla the Ancient One who resides in the Swamps of Sadness, as she should know what to do, where he also warns Atreyu of the dangers of these swamps. Unlike the movie where we learn of the swamps thanks to a voiceover narration by Bastion. And so Parmenter is the reason why Atreyu was at the Swamps of Sadness in the first place. The scene ends with Atreyu riding off, and Parmenter continues to shrink, till he becomes tiny. Then Gamork arrives at the scene, which startles Parmenter, where it looks like he's now shrunk so much, he's hiding in his own shoe. In fact, there's behind-the-scene photos of the kids from the NeverEnding Story playing around with these giant shoe props. Also, as the character shrinks, his hair seems to go from grey to white, showing us that thanks to being infected by the nothing, he is in fact dying. And just like the nothing, he himself is becoming nothing. 
So there are actually tons of other changes and minor tweaks made between the original German cut and the international cut. And I'm actually really glad that both versions of the movie exist. The never-ending story is such a well-loved timeless classic, a wonderful modern fairy tale full of heart and adventure, but it doesn't stray away from danger and tragedy, treating its child audience with respect and intelligence by not having to make everything safe and like a cartoon. This movie has its hardships, but it's these hardships of the story which make the victories even more sensational and fulfilling. And well, for such a magical movie that has now been a part of people's lives for 40 years, it's fascinating to go back and explore this alternative cut, like it's the never-ending story from a parallel universe. A glimpse into what the movie could have been like to audiences outside Germany. And like the movie itself, Watching this alternative cut is like asking, what if? I think that right now the never ending story is more relevant than ever, as it's explained that the nothing grows stronger because people have lost their hopes and dreams. In other words, a world that has given up on hope and lost its optimism and happiness, and is now a pessimistic state of decay. And, well, given the current state of the world, I think we could all do with more hopes and dreams, and for our hearts to be filled with wonder and joy. So never forget, a little bit of hope goes a long way. Personally, I prefer the international cut. Although I think the original German cut does have some interesting ideas and makes for an interesting watch, you know, to see an alternative version of the never-ending story. I just feel like the international cut has a better flow. And of course, I love the awesome pop song version of the never-ending story theme. I mean, who wouldn't love that? But this is all just my opinion. And regardless, I mean, it's the never-ending story. So really, both versions are masterpieces. Anyway, I'm Minty, and this channel just reached 500,000 subscribers! That's crazy! <laughs> 500,000 subscribers! So, from the bottom of the heart, I just want to thank each and every one of you who has given me the time and subscribed. I think you're all awesome and amazing. See ya! We're on the same mission. After all, if the Empress can't save us, who could?